part-time flights and improving customer service. Tomorrow will start mostly cloudy with patchy light rain or drizzle at times over the eastern half of the country. Drier in the west with sunny spells. Highest temperatures of 13 to 15 degrees. Now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. Yeah, and you're very welcome back to Thursday Night's Off the Ball. It's Richie McCormick here with you right through until 10 p.m. Lots still to come on the show tonight. As we mentioned, the managerial merry-go-round turning at pace in Italy. Nicky Bandini will join us on the line to discuss the latest goings-on. Conte's gone at Inter. Possibly Simone Inzaghi is going to replace him there. Also, uh, we're seeing this week uh, that's going to be a change at Juventus with Max Allegri heading back in the door at the expense of Andrea Pirlo. Plus, we'll look at Tottenham and whether or not Mauricio Pochettino is going to be going back to Spurs and what that could mean for Harry Kane and for the Republic of Ireland's own Matt Doherty. But from North London, we go off to Indianapolis because it's time to catch up with somebody who's had a very interesting journey over the course of the last decade from Connacht rugby and Galway and all that kind of stuff. Uh, to kicking in American football in the Spring League. Tig Leader, come in. How's it going? How are you? Cheers for having me. You're very welcome. Listen, we were talking in the news round about how Naomi Osaka may or may not be doing press conferences um, straight after her French Open matches in the next couple of weeks. And here we are talking to somebody on the day of a game. Uh, we're finding ourselves in a very, very fortunate position, Tig. Yeah, um, it's actually mad. We're, we're playing locally here at 10pm tonight, so I've been told to be prepared to be... Uh, in the stadium playing until half one near two in the morning so yeah i'm trying to still trying to wrap my head around that but chatting to you lads is good helps me pass the day it's a long old day <laughs> actually looking for helping you pass the day and getting on with the game and that's uh that's probably a good thing um we, we could be forever telling you about how you're getting on and in, or how you got to indianapolis and, and the aviators over there in the spring league but how has it been because even just going through the roster if you're to uh pick through your teammates there at the Aviators you're seeing people from Boston from um, Missouri from Minneapolis from pretty much all over the map in terms of the United States and sticking out like a sore thumb with just Ireland beside the name is you what's it like to be in such a I'm not going to say a league of nations but to be from uh, playing in a team that's from such a diverse background given your background yourself playing with people from the locality yeah, yeah it's mad um, yeah, some of the lads um, I don't think they didn't have a clue where Ireland even was when I introduced myself on the first day, let alone when I said my name's Tig. So I'm just, um, the nickname's Tiger now, so they're all just calling me that. It's uh, making life easier. But um, be, yeah, being in this environment, it's, it's, I'm still wrapping my head around it. I'm probably five weeks into this now. Um, and just, I didn't really know what to expect, having never played um, football, let alone, I think um, just this morning uh, we just had a little walkthrough, and you know half our defense has already played in the NFL. So I'm rubbing shoulders with, as you said, lads from all over the country, but lads with um, you know top end experience. So I'm just trying to to soak it all up. But thankfully, being the kicker, you know we've limited enough things we need to know. There's no playbook for us. Just kind of kick it long and straight, and everyone everyone be happy enough with that. It's a, a remarkable journey. You started off from a very steeped in you know rugby family you know your dad was involved with Galwegians your brother's obviously uh, involved with Connacht as well uh, Dara most recently it's been you know quite the journey you managed to break the breakthrough at Connacht but ultimately injuries kind of took their toll yeah yeah um, unreal unreal time kind of going through the, 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 the Connacht and the underage system there back home and but yeah, as so many lads, kind of injuries injuries happen. But thankfully for me, you know, on the back of that, I, I kind of you know broadened my horizon a little bit and it gave me the chance to to go to do something new. And that was initially I played out in Italy, signed for an Italian team, was there for a bit. Unfortunately, injuries followed me there. But um, through that that injury, I ended up getting my shoulder reconstruction reconstructed, and then that allowed me. Um, I was going to be out of the game for at least a year with that. So that allowed me to move to the states to uh, to study. Um, so that was 2016, I think, I moved over, more moved to study, and um, since then, kind of professional rugby's taken off in the states. Um, got a bit involved with the U.S. men's eagles, the national team, and uh, COVID hit, and then football opened up. So yeah, it's it's been a it's been a mad journey, wild one, but um, unreal experiences though that come with that. So I'm just happy to be kind of you know just seeing where this takes me. Is that a family thing? Is that like, are, are the leader clan a kind of an outward looking group that they would go and, and seek opportunities wherever they might come, or, or were you the, the kind of lone wolf who decided to head off and forge his own path? 
No, I think it's it's in the family. Um, I know mum, she's from Lockray in Galway. I know she left when she was like 18 and moved abroad to London on her own and just figured it out. So I know it's been in the blood um, in that regard. And funnily enough, you mentioned Dara there. Uh, he unfortunately had to retire there last year due to, due to injury, but he's you know he's out here in the States now at um, Clemson University coaching, coaching rugby and doing his master's. So no, I think we've been pretty good just to to kind of pack our bags and see where we ta- see where we take us and um, yeah since moving to the states just more and more doors have kind of kept on opening through sport or education and um, so why not why not take advantage advantage of them when I can I'll be a long time retired exactly the the move to America in the first place because you know you were playing in Boston you're studying and stuff like that and then you were basically almost kicked off a team because you were overly qualified because you'd played on a professional level so they thought yeah, this major, you're you're almost a ring we're kind of thinking of the uh, the professional baseball players who come in and play for Mr Burns team and the Simpsons you were almost like that kind of figure you're fair play you've done your research yeah um, so that's kind of that happened there but then again kind of continue with that with that team uh, well basically with that it's just in American sports is a scholarship system and the fact that kind of rules and regulations so unfortunately uh, due to my background playing back back home there and in Italy I was deemed ineligible to, ineligible to play collegiate sports but that opened up you know again wasn't ideal but I ended up getting uh, into coaching and I loved that and also at that same time you know I had more time on my hands than I ex- expected so I ended up doing some actually sports agency work which was quite cool because I was doing my sports management degree and funnily enough um the first one of the first players I worked with and sent to the to, over to Europe. He actually just won a Heineken Cup medal at the weekend. So pretty pretty random how the he was seventeen at the time and we sent, and he went to Toulouse. And um but anyway, through the rugby through rugby, um one door closed in that regard, but then coaching and the agency thing opened up and then um yeah, I, I guess I've been fortunate when one door is closed, just I've got lucky to a degree that another opportunity is opened and then just trying to kind of put your head down and just make the best out of it. What's working in sports agency like? Oh, uh, tough. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to know what to believe at times, to be honest with you. Because um, I've been through it as a player, so it's quite interesting to actually get a little bit of a look at it from vantage point from the kind of inside. Yeah. Um, and yeah, trying to be, I think, the best agents uh, you want them to be as honest with you as possible versus kind of selling you something that might necessarily be happening. So that was something that I that I tried to kind of pride myself on um, when I was doing that. But yeah, re- really interesting. I, and I worked with a guy, a few Irish guys actually that ended up going out to Zebra, um, a guy, Kieran Gaffney from Galway and Rory Prader, another Irish lad. So it was cool, really good experiences. It, was, and it just, again, happened purely random, pure random on the back of being in, ineligible to play college rugby. So I had more time on my hands and America's full of um, talented players and athletes, but they didn't necessarily have the connections uh, to go overseas. So. Yeah, I got to connect the dots for a little bit there before Major League Rugby came along. So I had to hang up my agency boots and jump back into playing professionally. It is something that's building there, though, kind of slowly and steadily. The Major League Rugby thing, I guess they've learned a couple of lessons from how they managed to build soccer, managed to build that product over there and essentially sell it as a product and make it something that can be identifiable to the public. And they seem to be doing a better job from the outside looking in. I don't know what you made of it. Yeah, it's it's definitely... Um, it's growing. Uh, there's still, you know, being on the inside, there's obviously a, a lot of things that still need to be, yeah, a lot of work to be done um, in terms of if you want to compare it, at least from the athletes, the players' point of view to what you'd expect back back there and um, being in the provinces. But, you know, there's always going to be growing pains. But then from the, you know, just the product itself on the pitch, it's getting better. The likes of Matt Gitto and stuff uh, are all over here playing. Bastero was here last year, so some big names out here. And then, I think fans fans are definitely I think it's just about exposing them to the sport because you know they all love football um mm. like everyone here loves football so just the idea of you know rugby being constant is not as I'm learning here these games is constant stop start uh, timeouts all the time so it's just so the game itself you know takes so long there's no kind of fluidity to it so I think with the with the rugby that that is something a lot of the American fans when they actually watch it for the first time Alongside, you know, getting the contact and they love the scrums and lineouts, um, but just the constant pace and the hitting that comes with it. So I think I do think you know there's definitely good infrastructure in place now to keep building upon it. But I think it still has a while. It still has a long way to go to you know be a, be a top top league. But it's it's going in the right direction. From an American point of view, does it benefit or is it hurt by those comparisons with American football? I think it's, I think it's it. it 
you can kind of like draw certain parallels um, in terms of explaining it initially. You know, everyone talks about the con- or the contact element, which kind of draws people in. You talk about not wearing pads, so then, as I hear all the time, you know, you know, American people would see rugby and they go, "Oh, you guys are crazy," you know, because they're used <laughs> to seeing guys in pads running into each other. So you get that. Granted, I've never been a big fan of all the contact playing ten, but and um, you know, they 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 do love that point of view. I, th- I think it's I think it's easier to understand. One thing you're going to see a lot now on the back of football that is, but one thing is, you know, sevens quite sevens is quite decent here. Sure. The U.S. national team does quite well, so you know that's an easier form of the game to digest and understand what's actually happening but um and a lot of crossover athletes are happening now so no i think it's there's pros and cons but i find it easier to kind of maybe explain the game a little bit at least initially what what rugby is kind of about uh, you, you do rely on some of those football things but obviously there's a lot more detail beyond that of course yeah like you ended up like playing uh, for the for the usa eagles that had to have been something of a bizarre experience um seemed to have <laughs> been something that i guess was almost thrown at you rather than you kind of sought out yeah so in, initially i was aware because um aj mcginty um you know he's he was a irish irish player moved over to study in the states and he went to i think 2015 world cup um and he like had an unreal tournament and then went on to you know play for connacht and won a won the pro 12 at the time so i was aware of what he did um but once I got over, so I knew there was a potential pathway. But once I got over here and was deemed ineligible to play college rugby, you know, I wasn't playing rugby at all then. Uh, well, I was playing a local D3 men's team who I was also coaching. Um, so, so, yeah, so I wasn't playing rugby. So there's like two years there where I, uh, as I said, I was doing the coaching stuff and the agency stuff and just just commit, just en- enjoying rugby, but not from a playing point of view because obviously the level wasn't, wasn't great. Um, but really fun. I had a great crack doing that. We won a national championship. With that team and a lot of fun doing that but le- level of play wasn't great so when major league rugby came along i i kind of was assigned for san diego and was kind of back on the horse a little bit then and you know back into like full-time full-time rugby um and then but then i had to become eligible with world rugby and, and that wasn't a straightforward process um it was kind of back and forth quite a while with paperwork and documentation and you know under the three-year rule so that wasn't easy and i actually the first time Near, near the end of this process, Ireland were actually playing against the Eagles in Dublin, probably late 2018. So that was my first experience with the Eagles. Although I wasn't, you know, fully eligible yet, I flew. They flew me over for that game, and I was with the team for the, for that week and um, the lead up to to the to the game. So that was very cool to to see to be part of that. Um, let alone against Ireland. So that was that was a great experience. And then yeah, fast forward a month or two after that, I became eligible, and I was coming off the bench playing against Chile down in South America. So it was all, it was all, yeah, I didn't even know they had a rugby team to be honest with you. So it was all a bit random how, how, how quickly it all happened. Um, but again, like I think we next week we had Argentina again down there, like the Argentina A team. And so those experiences, like un- unreal, amazing. It's, a, it's amazing. It, the idea of leaving rugby, which I unfortunately have to do, but to pursue this, but having at least kind of got those experiences, experiences of playing, of playing at that level, obviously would like to more of it, but you know, things happen. I've been, as I mentioned already now, I've just kind of pivoted it when things, when certain doors open, but yeah, playing international rugby with the Eagles was fast and there's quite a good Irish contingent on the team as well. So of course, yeah. I made life easier, adjust, adjust to that. It, it's got to be a bizarre experience nonetheless, though, to be warming up at the Aviva stadium and you're almost wearing the wrong colors in, in, in so many words. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I know a few because a few of the lads I know, and um, they're in Finley, and there's two lads are playing for Ireland that day. And um, Richie Murphy, he's the Ar- the Ireland kicking coach, I believe, or skills. Remember, he skills looked coach, at me because yeah. Uh, yeah, he looked to be kind of like, what, what are you doing? Because I would you would have crossed paths over the years, and it's kind of, what are you doing here with the with the US? So I I did have that, and one or two people in the stand actually that I that I knew, you know, they had no clue I was with the Eagles team, and just shouting at me and heading over to them and them asking what's going on and me not really having a great answer just kind of <laughs> sure, you know, three or four days ago I was in class three or four days ago I was in class in St. Louis, Missouri and I got a call to, uh, to get on the, you know find, you know, get to the airport as quick as possible um, and then over I went to Dublin so yeah it was all it was all a bit mad but again like a class and unreal to have 
have had have had those experiences. Of course, yeah. Did you have any uh, input or any conversations with um, Luke Carty, who we saw this week being named in a, I guess, a developmental squad for the United States? Like, I know you came up with Jack around the same time as him. Did you mm-hmm. manage to have any conversations with him and describe to him what the situation is like over there, or are you letting him play his own for us? Actually, yeah. So, so for the last since he came over and he's um, he's been doing very well for LA. I've been obviously in this in this full time football environment, so I haven't really been. I've haven't I haven't chatted to many of the lads at all, to be honest. But it's good. It's fair play to him. Um, I think he, he he'll do well, especially getting into the squad at a good young age. Um, if Santa Maria could have changed, it would have been nicer probably, you know, to get in when you're in your early twenties versus your late twenties. But yeah. I'm sure he'll do well. And um, yeah, we're looking for, like. And he's out there, there's a few Irish lads out there in LA playing in the Major League Rugby and having a judging by their Instagram, they're having a great old time. How did you get noticed kicking balls by people who are involved in American football? Because like it's one thing to be an out half and as you mentioned there, there's a you know, a lot of processes involved in kicking and it's you know, it's a very different um I guess discipline because there's a lot of curve involved in the ball and there's a lot of kicking from different positions whereas American football is a little bit more straightforward were you just booting the ball and somebody put their you know hand to their chin and went hmm maybe this guy could work in American football or was it a little bit more complicated than that no it wasn't it wasn't much more complicated than that um <laughs> I, I I'd been told I'd been advised you know um to, to give it a go but this is when I was playing rugby you know I was playing major league rugby yeah. was about to get caps and stuff like that, so everything was great. So I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't even looking into it. But then, kind of when COVID hit, um, just I, I, I honestly just went to scratch the itch because people had told me to do it. So I just went down and kicked some footballs at a at a local high school in um, in Boston, and didn't really did I had all my steps all wrong. I had all these rugby steps, which is very different to football. Didn't really know what I was doing, but I was able to to hit them pretty well and. Again, I didn't really know how good it was, but it was, it was quite a funny experience because it, typically here at the high schools, you have a running track as well on the outside. Yeah. Um, and there's people heading around the running track and they kind of started, they stopped their walking or running, came over or just watching me kick and standing there asking questions. And, you know, by the end of it, there was a, there was a decent amount of people just watching me kick there. And then I thought, oh, maybe there is more to this than, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm better than probably I thought I, I thought I was, or I didn't really know the level, to be honest with you. Yeah. So I didn't... I didn't know what what I was doing was that where that stacked up against you know good guys. Um, so that that was that's just how it started, and then I just kept exploring it, um, looking into it. There's a kicking coach out in San Diego. Uh, he kicked in the NFL for 23 years, so I said, you know what, if I give that, a, I'll go out there and meet him. So just pack my bags, go up to San Diego, train there for a week, and he trains a lot of the current NFL guys. So I was kicking with a lot of them and the free agents, uh, free agents meaning guys that aren't signed, but they're kind of around that level. And stacked up pretty well, and that was only back in late November. So then, basically, at the month of December, then to, and the feedback was there's there's definitely enough ability there to to give this a go. Um, so then, I, in December, I had to make the decision: am I going playing rugby, or am I going am I going to give this football stuff a crack? And I just thought, you know, if not now, never. I'll never get the opportunity again to do this. So that's so then I moved up to San Diego in January full time, and then uh, the last. Six eight weeks I've been in this spring league and um, playing, so uh, that's that's kind of how all that transpired. Yeah, that kind of coaching, that kind of one on one, especially expertise from people who've, who've worked in the NFL, that usually doesn't come cheap. No, no, it does, <laughs> it does not. Um, or renting an apartment in, in San Diego for two or three months and all that crap. So no, it does not. But um, I guess I just thought of it, you know, as 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 an, like an, inve- an investment in myself. Um, and you know, if this if this works out, it'll be fantastic. Even if if it does, it does. If it doesn't, I I still had these unreal and amazing experiences. But um, I still think there's a good road ahead ahead for me. But yeah, the, the the American coaches and the cost that comes with playing sport here until you until you're in the professional level is is um hard to fathom. It, that that's not just like from the coaching point of view. Like it, it's costly kind of across the board. Well, the coaching. <laughs> one of the coaches is charging like twelve hundred dollars for a session, so that's like that's expensive. But then, yeah, ju- ju- just all the stuff that comes with that. Um, in terms of yeah, like well, the good thing is a lot of the stuff we do initially, the, 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 from a kicking perspective, thankfully we don't always have to wear the pads and the helmet and all that kind of stuff. At least initially, when they're assessing you as kickers, you're just you're like you're playing Gaelic football, you're just in your shorts and your t-shirt. So that's grand. But um, 
yeah, I, my first time putting on a helmet and pads was you know the week of my first game, so that was a that was a different experience. It's kind of the helmet reminded me a bit of hurling, but there's nothing to compare to wearing these massive pads on your shoulder. My, 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 without wanting to make the comparison, my littlest lad when he got his 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 first hurling helmet wore that around the house pretty much all day. Was it a case when you got your first set of pads in your helmet that you, just for the sheer weirdness of having that stuff on you, did you have to spend a decent chunk of time getting used to it or did you throw it on and off and go, okay, grand, I can put on, get on with this down the road? Uh, no, once once I got it all, I was I, put, I had it on had it on as much as I could because just to kind of get used to that that big shell and as I said, it's like somewhat like hurting, but it's more round and it's heavy. Um, so getting used to that and then the pads, just your range of motion. Thankfully, as kickers, we don't have to wear you know the massive pads the lads wear yeah. wear that I've taken contact. But um, no, it, it does it does take getting used to it. like it and especially now um, we're training here at most stages, you know, thirty plus degrees Celsius, so it's. You, you, you become very aware of them, but to be honest, in the in the in the heat of the moment, in terms of kicking, you, I don't really notice them that much. But just looking them around, and then they like, trying to get lads to help me put them on and things like that. I'm still learning kind of tricks of the trade in that regard. You can always tell the the Irish fellow over the sideline he has two people helping him, two people helping me get, get this get the stuff on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a different world. On the, on the coaching side of things, like did, I know you had a decent old hoof on you, like you could you know kick the ball about sixty odd yards. But in terms of um, approach and how you go about all that kind of stuff, were they trying to knock bad habits out of you? Were they trying to pick up on stuff that they thought you did well that you can build upon? What was the kind of coach building towards you being a kicker? Yeah. Um, so initially, it was, like, things were moving pretty quick because um, if you're getting good foot to ball contact, regardless of the angle or amount of steps you take leading up to it, if, you, you know, if you're getting that piece of the puzzle right, you're going to have pretty decent outcomes. But then once I got more and more into this, you start to realize, okay, now in a, you know, in a real game scenario, you have 1.2, 1.3 seconds between the ball being snapped. You know, so the guy throwing it between his legs back to the holder who catches it, who then places it for me to kick 1.2, 1.3 seconds. That, that was a, uh, that's rapid. Like the, the margin of error, well, there is. It's, there's like, you're a split mm-hmm. second off and you're getting blocked. So that was a huge thing I had to learn with the rugby taking four steps back and four to the side. You, you can't do that here because you, you know, you just you want to take too long. So I had to change up things like that. Um, there's certain things we do in rugby that are I'd be deemed an unorthodox kicker, um, meaning I'm kind of more comfortable kicking a little bit more with my hips towards the sideline which would be it's kicking and punting which would be more like a, like you know kicking a Gaelic football a lot of time your kind of hips a little bit sideways, which a lot of the coaches wouldn't you know they wouldn't advise that um, just because the, the American guys are a lot more robotic if you ever watch them yeah. you know the, the, their style is very square to the ball which is just weird for me it's, it's, it's again I think playing Gaelic football and rugby we didn't really kick it like that ever so um, I had to try and adjust that a little bit but they recognized that I was the way I was doing it. It was the ball was going, you know, the main thing is a getting it high enough um, because you, you have a six foot eight Olympic level athlete eight yards away from you who's jumping. So you got to get it up over him as well. So first thing is getting it high enough and then obviously getting it straight. And I was doing that. So thankfully they didn't try and change too much. If I was younger, they probably would have. Yeah. Um, but thankfully I didn't have to go down that road too much, but it's the timing. It timing is, 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 is everything in this. And as, with that in mind, you, essentially, it's not just up to you. Like between every, with the person yeah. snapping, the person holding, and then you, you as a unit have to be working in absolute lockstep. Yeah, exactly. Um, I didn't really appreciate, you know, watching watching lads kick, or watching a bit of football, and the guy miss a kick. You know, I thought and think, ah, oh, I reckon I could score that, or you know, some. You have those thoughts just even before I knew much, before I knew anything about football. But now, have now being in this environment, you realise. Yeah, like if, if your snapper takes point point seven or point seven five of a second, now you've he's taken point five of a second or point zero five of a second off of me, um, which in as I said in the grand scheme of things, if you take if you take one point three four seconds, you're probably getting blocked. Um, and I find it hard to wrap my head around that, like thinking point point zero two point zero three of a second, like what? Is that how much of a difference really? But um, it's it's absolutely huge. So yeah, you, you you have to have huge trust in them because essentially. You know, from once the call goes, I'm back in my stance and I kind of do what I need to do. And then once I'm ready to go and I give that nod, um, when the ball is is passed, when the ball snapped back, I'm approaching a ball that, you know, isn't set yet, isn't on the ground yet. So 
it's only that last step into the ball where that ball is you know firmly on the ground and then I like the ball leaned a little bit which means my holder has to try and put a little bit of, angle, a bit of an angle on it um, whilst also the laces on the football getting the laces of the ball kind of away from my foot because you don't want to kick that so yeah, the margin, like the, the the timing and the trust you have to have in those lads is huge. So you, well, whilst all the big lads are off running their routes, they're doing the defensive stuff. We're kind of over in the sideline, just keep repping out that timing. Because um, as I've learned in training, you're you're off by the, the smallest of margins, and some fellas getting his hand to it. Is it important then to build those kind of personal relationships? Because the thing you always see about American football is it's like it's it's offense and defense, and you've got people sitting on the sideline essentially for half the game, yada yada yada. But the reality of it is, is that you need to. Uh, be really simpatico with everything that's going on around you and that you need to be with those three people especially um, able to get on with them and able to convey what you need from your snapper from your placer to get the job done yeah yeah we spend it, it, it's different because yeah coming from coming from rugby you know everyone's very connected on the team unless you're split to backs and forwards you know beyond that most of the drills you're doing whether it's like breakdown or whatever it's passing tackling you know you're usually together and the team's mixed um, like backs and forwards, everyone's in the same in the same in the same boat. Whereas here, it's it's very much three separate teams: offense, defense, mm-hmm. and special teams. Um, so, yeah, I you don't have the the same connection with you know the way you'd have a connection with lads in the rugby team with most guys. You, you don't you can't really have that here because there's just too many there's too many guys to have that. So, like, as you said, just for me, it's all about you know the snapper and holder. So we're going for coffees together, we're going for breakfast and things like that and just becoming coming good mates with them but just you know so it makes it easier in the in in the game because to be, the first game when the coach shouted out field goal and I'm, I'm sitting down there drinking my water and just kind of just watching um you know things get pretty chaotic pretty quickly and especially you have like i think at the think of the time you had like 20 seconds to get on get everything done and get a kickoff before the clock ran out so Having having complete trust with those two lads, the snapper and holder, is, is critical. Because if you don't, you, you're going to hesitate, and if you hesitate, you're blocked. Um, yeah. So it's in that regard, you, you you just don't have time really to question it. Or worse still, you might have to get involved in some tackling, some you know, four hundred oh, no. pound monster. <laughs> yeah, that 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 was actually my biggest surprise when I came again. Rugby lads, you know, big lads. But yeah. when I went into my first team meeting here, I was like, whoa, this is different. Like, just absolute massive, massive, massive men. But then again, you know, like, they only have to, you know, move three or four yards and they're, they're play on, play off kind of thing. But just the sheer size of some of these guys, you know, I've never felt so small. <laughs> um, in terms of, like, like the processes of it seem to be something that appeals to you. Can you see yourself as a kicking coach down the line? Yeah, actually, um, I, I I definitely can. I've learned learned so much, and more more than likely, I see myself going back to um, you know from a rugby perspective, maybe coaching like the rugby and rugby kickers or something like that. Who who knows? But I've I've learned the amount of detail that we go into here from a kicking perspective in football is is way more than what I've done in rugby. Just because you know in, in rugby it's just one person, at least from a place kicking perspective, it's one person, mm-hmm. and it's. You know, it's not there's not a specific coach just for that. There might be a kicking coach, but whereas here, you know, as a specialist, that's all we do. Um, so obviously, the, we just there's just a lot more that goes into it. So I've, I've learned I've learned a lot. Um, so yeah, definitely, if I can, and I've, as as you kind of alluded to earlier, I spent a lot of money trying to get all that information. So if I can help help someone else down the line, I have to go down that uh, that rabbit hole and make it all the better. Uh, you're with the Aviators at the moment. I believe they're they're based out of Indianapolis. Um, in, in the Spring League, which for a lot of people, one way or the other, could be viewed as, as purgatory. Some people would want to, you know, they're taking time, they're, they've been in an NFL franchise, they've worked their way back down, they could be looking to get back up again. What's your, what are you looking to get out of being a Spring League player? Yeah, so, um, just ex- exposure, uh, well, exper- experience and exposure. I think, you know, the name of the game within the league here is, is just, you know, everyone's trying to accumulate their footage because um, NFL, Camps are, are getting under getting underway now, so you know, they can have 90, men, 90 people on their on the rosters. Um, so everyone's all about ex- exposure, um, so that's huge. But then for me, obviously, not having ever played ever, so obviously experience is a uh, is a big thing as well for me. So just trying to learn, because as I said, the games are so long. And um, the first game, I was sitting on the sideline for I think like an hour and twenty minutes before before I got my opportunity, which is just before the end of the first half. And it's, it's just trying to get used to, 
you know, you're just sitting down drinking water, looking in the stands, trying trying to detach from the game a little bit. That's what some of the advice that I've been given is don't get too too involved, too like emotional about it at all. Just try and do your own thing. So I'm just kind of off. If everyone is on one side of the field, I'm the other side of the field, just sitting down, drinking my water. Um, but you know, trying to get the experience point of view is knowing when your number is called, you're just you're up quickly. You're getting your helmet helmet on, and then you're just trying to get your get on the field, get your marking, get your line, get, you know, connect with your holder, get, you know, all those kind of things that um, the only way I can learn it is by doing. So experience is huge. And then, yeah, if it, keep getting good experience. And then the, obviously at the back of that, keep accumulating good film. We're, we're halfway through the season. I think tonight's, yeah, tonight's our fourth game. So um, tonight plus two more to go. And then I'm hoping that, you know, I would have, because I, 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 I kind of at the start, some, I was able to reach out to some teams and two agents. People kind of looked at me and could see I was a good kicker, but obviously, having never kicked before, you know, there's natural enough this hesitancy, especially in the NFL. They say it stands for not for long. So, if you're a scout, um, you know, if you're a scout. If you were to bring in this Irish fella who's played rugby and I go in there and miss two or three kicks in training camp, you know, he might get fired, which right. is just ridiculous. But that's just the level of it is. So. At least now that I've put together some tape and stuff, I'd be hoping that um, you know some do- some doors might open for me in the in the near future. And thankfully now, uh, I initially just started off kicking, which is my place kicking and taking the kickoffs. But I've got a good opportunity now. Last week I started punting in the games um, in the warm up. Our punter went down, and the coach asked, "How'd you punt it?" I just kind of nodded my head as if like <laughs> I, I was saying yes, but obviously have I have I yeah no I have not punted before. Um, but I didn't want to tell them too much in case they'd hesitate to give me the job. And anyway, it went well. So now yeah. I've kind of added that to my um, to my skill set, say. So I'm hoping that makes it more attractive as well. So essentially, you're putting together, for want of a better term, show reels in all of this. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and I think that, that that's 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 the name of the league, really, for the most part. Um, as you, yeah, like as you said, it's guys that have out of the league they want to get back in and need to show their fit maybe it could be injury a lot of the guys actually that's the reason why they lost their contract so showing yeah. that they're fit and healthy and ready to go um, every day as well you know there's one or two guys getting a call uh, in the hotel to to leave to go to an NFL team so it's just constant constant guys getting called here um, the team we're playing tonight lost one of their with one of their best players early this morning because he got signed by the Titans I think so wow. it's, it's this constant yeah this constant move, moving um, moving parts here so I'm just trying to yeah, get that exposure and hopefully I can jump on jump on that train and see where it takes me. But it shows that all of that can happen quite quickly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and um, the the more lads I chat to, um, y- you realise that you can get yeah you can get that call at any moment. Or um, as I experienced, I was actually the, the the spring league has a team in Houston. I was with the team in Houston, um, but I actually. I wanted to get traded here to Indianapolis and, you know, I was sitting down having my breakfast at 7 a.m. and by 8.30 a.m. I was on a plane here to Indianapolis. Um, so there's that side of it as well. How quickly things can change and you get traded and moved around cities. So you just have to be <laughs> just, um, I feel for my girlfriend at times because, you know, she's saying, what what's next? And you know, the answer is I don't know and God knows where we're going to be. Um, but you just, you just kind of have to roll with the punches in that regard. But again, it's 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 exciting. It's cool. Like what an ama- what a unique thing I'm getting to do. So I'm just trying to take it all in my stride, really. Yeah, it's it's absolutely remarkable the journey you've been on so far, and the one that could lie in wait over the course of the next, who knows, uh, three weeks, three years. And um, I'm sure, Ty, at some point we're going to have to uh, stop by again and, and catch up with you and see where you end up. Because uh, judging by the last few years, it uh, could be anywhere. And uh, God willing, it will be in the NFL. Uh, Ty, leader, thank you so much, and best of luck tonight as well. Cheers. Thank you very much. Good chatting. Cheers, Ty. There you go. That's Ty Leader who is uh, off playing with the Indianapolis Aviators. And uh, yeah, remarkable stuff. Rugby coverage on Off the Ball. Sounds a bit weird to be talking uh, rugby after. It's such a big American football chat, but rugby coverage on Off the Ball is brought to you with thanks to Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. Plenty still to come tonight. We'll be talking football uh, after nine o'clock with Nicky Bandini and with Martin Lipton. I'll be checking in with the football pod next. Rugby on Off the Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in. One, two, one, two. The Irish entertainment industry has been patiently waiting in the wings. And here on News Talk, we're putting live performances back center stage. Okay, sounds good. 